Well, greetings, home builders. Here we are on November the 1st, and our lesson for today is hope. Uh, we've been studying in the general epistles, and we have talked on a few occasions about how these epistles were written uh, to Christians who were experiencing the normal Christian life. So they're full of the message of hope. And, uh, you know, when we think about uh, great hymns, we started our morning this morning with the great hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. And I have sent a link, so I hope you enjoy that, of a group of guys singing that song. It's wonderful. But uh, we're fast approaching the election just a couple of days from now. And after the election, everyone is going to need hope. And uh, no matter whether you feel like you're winning or losing, we're all going to need hope. And what that does is it creates an opportunity for the gospel. And uh, we'll see that in just a minute. But I have three parts to our lesson today. Uh, you know, the first question is, well, what is the hope that everyone needs? The second question that follows from that is, what is the hope that we possess? What is the hope that's within us? And this comes from our verse in 1 Peter 3.15. And then, uh, how do we communicate this hope that's within us and the hope that everyone needs? So, back to what is the hope everyone needs? Now, when you think about this, and you think about how people process life and how they think about life and what gets them through life, uh, the desire is, the concern is that we will not perish. We will be preserved through this. This is the way these general epistles were written. They were written as if the apostles, you know, gathered these people under their arms and said, you know, we know that things are difficult. We know that you will experience trials. We know that it will only get worse. But through it all, you will be preserved, and you will be preserved through this. And uh, this is seen in the idea of being kept from Psalm 121. Now, Douglas Wilson just uh, yesterday uh, had a message on Psalm 121, but it's a short psalm, uh, just eight verses. And if you turn there, I'll read it. Uh, great encouragement here, the idea of being kept. It's a familiar uh, section of Scripture. Uh, perhaps some have memorized it. But he says, uh, the title is, The Lord, the Keeper of Israel. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Well, now, how encouraging is that already that the one who made heaven and earth, the great creator, the eternal one with all power and all authority is going to be our helper, is going to come to help us, come to our aid. He will not allow your, feet to, your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. So just as the Old Testament saints found encouragement in this psalm, uh, Peter wants the saints that he's writing to to find encouragement in his letters. And we can find the same encouragement today. So the desire that we would be preserved through this, no matter what befalls us. Now what's interesting is when we think about the names of God, the names of Jehovah, all of those represent the Redeemer, the Preserver, our Savior. I mean, just the names of God alone represent help that comes to us. And another thing that we've studied is from Genesis chapter 11, right after uh, men began to multiply after the great flood, they were fearful. They did not know God. Many of them did not know God. So they decided to construct this great, uh, you know, 
temple, I guess, uh, to the heavens so that they would have a name for themselves, that they would be preserved. They were fearful. That's just the natural state of man to be fearful. They were afraid that they would perish. So not knowing God, they set out to find a way that their uh, name would be preserved. But um, So that's the first thing that, that everyone needs is the idea that we're going to be preserved. The next thing everybody needs is a desire that we will see better days. Now, disregard a new human race, that came from a comment from the floor, and we'll get to that in a minute. But every person hopes to see better days. We hope to see a time when there's more justice. We hope to see a time when there's more compassion. You know, if you were born blind, your hope would be to see it all, to see better days, to be able to have sight restored. And what about for those who've lost loved ones? They hope to be reunited with their loved ones. And then, you know, anyone in any situation is going to hope to see better days. Uh, any calamity that befalls us. I mean, think about the person who's born without the ability to walk. What is their hope? That they would see better days, that there would be a day coming when they could actually walk. They could stand, they could run to their children. Their children could be gathered up in their arms. I mean, think of all those things, those great and hopeful things. So that's the hope that everyone needs to be preserved and to see better days. Now, the second point is, what is the hope that is within you? Now, we see that in 1 Peter 3.15, and if you would turn there, we'll take a look at that. And we've studied this. We've looked at it before, but it's worthy of our time to look at it again. He says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you. And we'll talk about that just in a minute. To give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So Peter's talking about the hope that is in us. So where can we find out about that? Well, look at Jeremiah 29, 11. These are familiar verses. But this is what hope uh, Jeremiah the prophet had in hearing the word of the Lord. And the Lord says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And I just love the way these two words are put together, future and hope. You know, that's the desire to see better days. That's the desire to be preserved that's the desire to be preserved through this, is that we would see better days and that we would have a future. I mean, this is the great provision. This is the great promise of Jehovah, of our God, the God who provides. So what an encouragement that is. I'm sure some of you have even committed this to, to memory. Let's look at Job 19.25. So... Now, we're coming up on the Christmas season in not too many days, and uh, we'll probably be listening to Handel's Messiah, and this is absolutely one of the most beautiful uh, songs that's ever been penned, uh, that's ever been sung, and it's, for, uh, I know that my Redeemer liveth. So verse 25 says, this is Job, he says, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Now think about the hope. Think about the promise of that. That I know that my Redeemer liveth and that I will be with him as he takes his stand on the earth in the last days. So think about the hope that we have as Christians, that we will be in him. We will be with him. He will be present with us and he will be exalted. He will take his stand. What a great hope that is. So then, as I mentioned, Peter, both of his letters are full of hope. Let's look at 1 Peter 4, 11. Back to Peter. 1 Peter 4, 11. 
Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so, he's talking about the gifts here, is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. So the one to whom glory and dominion forever and ever belongs is the one who is our Savior, the one who calls us brother, the one who we are in, the one who is in us. And we will see him, we will be with him. How about verse, this is chapter 4, verse 13. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, okay, he acknowledges that it's going to be bad. You're going to wonder if you're going to be preserved through this. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. So the reality there is that we're going to be with him when he is exalted. So we'll be with him. Now how about chapter 5, verses 10 and 11? After you have, here's again the introduction, after you have suffered for a little while, we're going to look for better days, right? We're going to be preserved through this. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. So he has called you out from among all people. You are the called ones who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. Will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Now, who is the one that's going to do this? To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, how is that for a hope? How is that for encouragement for people who are going through trials, through, that are going to suffer, that are currently suffering and only have suffering to look forward to in this life? Now, he continues in 2 Peter 3.13. But according to his promise, okay, he's the promiser. He's the one that we can count on. This is not my promise. This is his promise. We are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, isn't that what everybody's looking for? Better days, a way to get back to something that would be better. But how about a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells? Now, if that's a place where righteousness dwells, this is also a place where justice dwells, you know, where people are better. There's a new human race in this better day. There's a transformed human race. Sin is gone. Death is gone. Only the victor Christ remains and those who are found in him. I mean, what a promise we have. So... Now we come to the third point, which is, I think, critical. How do we, who have these promises, who have this hope within us, who have the hope that everyone needs, how do we communicate this hope? Well, from 1 Peter 3.15, as I read, he says, for everyone who asks you. And what he's saying here is that your life should be so different that people would say, what is the hope that is in you? Why are you so different? Why are you not like us? Why are you not despairing? One of the comments that came from the floor is that we should be joyful, not just full of hope, but it, hope should spill over to joy. So, but the reality is that not many people are going to ask us. Uh, I can see the truth in this. I can see uh, the desire that they would observe our lives and ask us. But in reality, not many people will. So what do we do? Well, how about if we ask them? How about if we say, what is your hope? Now, the reason this is so significant and the reason this is so available to us is think about this, that we're actually coming alongside of our fellows, people who need hope, and we're able to say to them, 
What are you hoping for? Where are you going? What is the destination that you hope to arrive at? So we can take control of this conversation by doing that, but take control in a way that sounds like we're there to help, that we're not actually confronting them. Well, oh, no, this is some other gospel conversation. This is another, you know, this is somebody trying to, to uh, push their religion on me. No, we're actually just coming alongside and making a, an inquiry into what is, what is your hope. And uh, I think that that can actually encourage our fellows. It can cause them to, to open up to us in some ways. We can actually help direct them to the hope that's found in Scripture, to the hope that's found in Christ. So uh, my desire is that in understanding this, we're going to be able to interact with our fellows, with our neighbors in a different sort of way. And it actually, you know, so many people, everybody's on some sort of a journey in life. They're trying to, to bring about better days. They're trying to, to, to transform the world. Uh, they're trying to, I, mean, I always quote Joni Mitchell in her song, Woodstock, you know, she said she came upon a child of God and he was walking along the road. And she asked him, she asked him this very question, where are you going? And she says, this he told me. He said, I'm going down to Yazger's farm. I'm going to join in a rock and roll band. I'm going to camp out on the land, and I'm going to try to get my soul free. Well, how, how complete is that? You know, but she, you know, it's just, a, it's just a, the idea of everybody is on a journey. They're heading somewhere, trying to get somewhere, with the hope that they're going to find better days. He was hoping that he could set his soul free. And just by asking the question, where are you going? What are you hoping for? you're in a conversation that can be a gospel conversation, that can be very encouraging, and it doesn't have to end there because uh, we have this hope within us. So, And the other point I think that's important for us to understand uh, as parents is that our kids have these same desires. You know, they have these same needs. They want to know. I mean, they're living in scary times. I grew up in the 50s and the 60s, and the 70s and we lived through the late 60s 1968 was a horrific year uh, it seemed like the country was going to come apart there were the same kinds of voices and and uh, rioting and uh, conflict in the streets but what was different about that time is the foundations were not shaken the foundations of family the foundations of the truth in the church all of those things were still intact. But now we have all of those things being shaken. And um, so our kids can be very frightened as they see this, as they see us being anxious and not necessarily being confident or joyful or hopeful or trusting God. So I think it's important that we talk to our kids and just say, honey, what do you hope in? What I mean, that sounds like a pretty heavy conversation for a young person, but you can have that with your older teens. And uh, I think everyone's going to, to hope that they see better days. So I, my desire is that that would spark conversations in your family. So I'm trying to conclude this without using the word hope again, but uh, I hope this has been a really an encouraging time for you. Uh, the scripture is full of hope because we desperately need it. Everyone needs the hope that we have. And to understand our fellows, to understand what they are going through, gives us the opportunity to communicate. So let me close us in prayer. Our Father and our God, we are so grateful that we are a people that have been called out. And as a called out people, we have the hope. We have the sure promise of eternal life. We have the sure promise that de death will be defeated. We have the sure promise of a new world, a world where righteousness dwells, a new world inhabited by justice and righteousness and a righteous people. So we're grateful for that. And Father, we ask that you would grant us opportunities to speak to our neighbors, to our families, to the people that we meet, that we would be gentle 
that we would be kind, that we would be understanding, that we would ask them, hey, where are you going? Where do you hope to arrive? What is the hope?